My plan today is to try out some ideas on you, and I have faith in all of you that you will point out the error of my ways, which is what I'm expecting. A couple of things here. First of all, special award to anybody who can figure out why I named my company 4.669 Evaluation and Planning. I don't know what that award will be, but I'll figure something out. So that's the first thing. Second thing I want to say is I'm the wrong guy to invite to this meeting. Because the last time I got invited to a meeting, it was at Research Triangle Institute, and they had a hurricane that day, and they had to change the meeting, just completely wipe out the meeting, because they had a complete evacuation of a three-state area, and then we did the meeting again a couple of months later. So I seem to bring that dark cloud with me wherever I go. But in any case, so l let me just get into this, and as I said, uh, I'm expecting people to point out the error of my ways, because I'm really sort of playing with ideas here. The first thing I want to do is to point out the name of my talk. I'm going to talk about constructs from evolutionary biology and from ecology. You'll notice it says a valuable framework for some evaluations. Right? I don't want to convey the idea that everybody should sort of run off and do this stuff even if you like it. Because the truth of the matter is sometimes it can be useful, I hope, but I guarantee that many times it can't be useful. It's sort of like someone teaches about logistic regression. You're not going to run off and use logistic regression for everything. But if you know about it, say, well, you know, I got this data. I can use logistic regression. So it means that you know that you can use it. So what I'm hoping is that this will help people rethink how they do certain kinds of evaluation. And when it's useful, that's great. And if it isn't, go do something else. Here's my first thought. We are all, you know, I like to say that when I went to graduate school, it's probably true for the rest of you also, that we're, ta that we're taught to worship at the altar of the general linear model. <laughs> but, but in some sense, that's true. And, you know, you can, you can look at the images I have up here. I just sort of pulled them. You have a, you know, a, 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 the plot of a regression line. There's an equation on the bottom to convey the idea that we have true score and error, and we're taught to believe that error is independent, that it's normally distributed, that it has a mean of zero, right? and we come to, that's an epistemological statement about how the world works. We care about different kinds of distributions, and this is the kind of stuff that we use to think about the world. What does it mean to use to think about the world? It means what I have here on the left. We think about models. I don't necessarily mean a logic model in the program evaluation sense, although I could. But we're talking about models. What kind of data do we need? Uh, what methodologies? How do we interpret data? What counts as an acceptable answer? What questions do we want to ask in the first place? What does it mean to make a convincing argument? Uh, how do we generate hypotheses? How do we sort of decide sort of what it is that we want to do? A choice of research designs and actually assembling research teams, right? What kind of intellectual capital do we need? And these are all the kinds of things that make for a discipline. What I'd like to stress, I think, is that these are not independent. You can think of these as things that are networked with each other. Uh, so for instance, if we believe certain things about data interpretation, it means we believe certain things about acceptable answers. So you can almost think about these things as nodes in a network. And the reason that matters is that in networks, and I don't want to get into a discussion of complexity here and sort of evolving networks and what have you, but in network behavior, you get emergent phenomena. And what an emergent phenomenon means is that it's not that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. It means the whole is different than the sum of its parts. Right? And so it's not, I'm going to pull this, I'm going to pull this, I'm going to pull that. But by thinking about all of these different things, we develop a mindset about how to approach the world. You'll notice it says, this is ours, but there are others. And when I'm going to talk about others, I'm going to talk about evolutionary biology and ecology, but I'm going to try to talk about it in the same terms. So what do we have here? We have a picture in the upper right that I stole from somewhere. I forget where, but it, you have the URL there. All I was doing is looking for some image that would convey the idea that lots goes into this. Same way if I asked you about evaluation, you would draw a picture with qualitative and quantitative data and you know, logic models and all kinds of stuff. And you know, you'd have a thing in the middle that says evaluation, all these different parts going into it. And somebody would look at that and say, oh, yeah, you got all this complicated stuff going on. So that's the kind of picture that I looked for. 
point is that this is another way of looking, another way of looking at a collection of models and data needs and methodologies and what have you. When is it worth the trouble to go about doing this? And the fact of the matter is, I'll speak for myself, I'm pretty comfortable with the paradigm that I learned in graduate school. And I know how to use it, and I use it very well, and I do a lot of very good evaluation with it. So why would I want to go ahead and look at things differently? And I think that most of you should look at this in a very jaundiced way, because most of the time, you should do what you feel comfortable with. What I hope to convince you of is that there are times when you might want to step out of your comfort zone and think in these terms. So when does it matter? Well, if you care about population size. Uh, now, by the way, when I say population size, what does that mean? It means you don't care about an individual program. You care about a collection of programs. Well, most of the evaluation I do, I care about an individual program. Uh, rates of change. How quickly do programs change? How quickly do groups of programs change? You, and you can think about, you know, sort of in ecology and evolutionary biology and species are changing over time and they're dying out and they're being born and this sort of relative question of how quickly that happens, that's a big deal. Types of programs, diversity is a very big deal in, in, in ecology. And, when I say diversity, I don't mean sort of race, creed, color, you know, that kind of thing. I mean diversity across multiple different kinds of dimensions. And the reason diversity is important is it has consequences for whether or not a species in the community can survive over time or not. Communities of programs, you have lots of different programs and they sort of live together in a community. Uh, and the idea that programs change over time. Most evaluations that I have done in my life don't care very much about any of this stuff. But some evaluations that I've done do care. What's more important for me is that what I have learned is that because I have become sensitive to these issues, I think about evaluation differently. So now if someone comes to me and presents me with some evaluation question, some, we have this program, we have this group of programs, we'll pay you money to figure out what it's doing and whether it's doing the world any good or not, because I am sensitive to these issues, I ask myself different questions about how to go about the, doing the evaluation, and I ask my customers different questions about what they want out of this program. By the way, I like calling them customers, not stakeholders and stuff like that, because that's really what they are. They pay me, I try to figure out what's going on for them. So what's it useful for? Conceptualizing program theory, methodology, analytical tools, and so on and so forth. Uh, and as I said, there are two advantages to this. One is there are times when any of these concepts is useful. The other is that it helps me interpret problems differently. And the example I give is this thing that I have on the right. Well, we have John, right, lower right. We have Johnny Morrell's radical new Artvark high tanning program. Someday I'll make up the details of how this Artvark high tanning program works. I have to find a subject matter expert in Artvark high tanning to do it. But essentially, I have two alternate universes. One is the one where we use a traditional mix of qualitative and quantitative methods that we're all comfortable with. And we'd have control groups if we could. And we'd do a time series if we could. And we'd do you know, in-depth interviewing if we could. And studies of social media so that we see what people in general think about the art of our high tanning programs, and so on and so forth. And then we have alternate universe number two, where we do the same thing, but we also include an evolutionary biology ecological perspective. And what I hope by the time I finish talking is that I get you to believe that there is a difference between alternate universe one and alternate universe two. Because if the evaluation ended up the same, I'd say don't bother with any of this stuff I'm talking about. If you think it will end up differently, then it's worth talking about it. And that's what I'm gonna to try to convince you of. I promise not to go through all this stuff. But essentially, there are a lot of concepts in evolutionary biology and ecology that we don't normally think of when we think about doing evaluation. And I'm not gonna worry about the middle column and the right-hand column and try to give lectures on all of this. But at least on an intuitive level, you can see that these are things that we don't usually talk about. Evolution, right? Spontaneous change and how do things change over time. Co-evolution, the idea that things are changing together. And people think of that as a synergy, but that might not be true. There's no guarantee that this co-evolution is good for everybody involved. Mutations, right? The idea of spontaneous change. We don't have programs that have a genetic component, but certainly we have programs that, you know, I spin a program off, it seems to be different in some way. 
fitness landscapes, the idea that trying to climb to the heights of a fitness landscape, uh, if the fitness landscape is jagged, then a small change will either get you all the way to the top or drop you down into a cliff. If it's a small, ch if it's a gentle landscape, a small little change might help a little bit, but if it's not a very positive change, nothing, nothing ventured, nothing gained. It's not, you know, and so this, is, I, this idea of fitness landscapes is something that's quite useful. Selection pressure, this gets back to evolution and change. There's something about the environment that makes some kind of changes in programs more desirable than other kinds. Birth and death rates, again, if we think about individual programs, we don't care. But if we think about types of programs, right, I've got STEM programs and I'm implementing these STEM programs across multiple schools and over a course of a couple of years, I care about how many STEM programs went away and how many STEM programs came into existence and does that mean that the population of STEM programs is going up or going down and that tells you something about STEM programs that at least I would not have thought of previously. If someone said, oh, I would have done that anyway, I'd say, okay, great, but before I got into this stuff, I did not think about things that way. And by the way, I'll, I'll get into something else. Birth and death rates, ecosystems, you just sort of take that for what it means. In ecology, we can take that for what it means. I gotta say here that nothing I have said just now says anything about whether these programs are worth doing or not. And the biggest limitation of thinking in terms of ecology and evolutionary biology is that it is agnostic as to whether or not the program is valuable. It has no values other than the success of the, of the species or of the community or the viability of the ecosystem, but it doesn't care. So these STEM programs I talked about, the perspective I'm talking about says nothing about whether the STEM programs are any good or not. It only says that we have these STEM programs and they're, they're viable or they're not viable and so on and so forth. So there are great limitations to what I'm saying here, and let's not forget that. So what I'm gonna do now is give you some examples. Let's see, I don't have, I'm gonna give you some examples of why thinking in terms of evolutionary biology and ecology might get you to think differently about how you do evaluation. Forget about the speciation, adaption, adaptation and selection pressure. We're gonna sort of take those at, at their face value and hopefully meaning will seep out as I begin to talk about this example, although if anybody really wants to know about it, I'm happy to lecture about any of these things ad nauseum and ad infinitum. Here we have a program. This program is loosely based on a program that my colleague Melinda Davy and I did on close call reporting systems in the railroad industry. And if anybody's, anybody's interested, you can see the URL there on the bottom. It's a 220 page report replete with more technical appendices, although I'm sure you've all written stuff like that, and so if you want all 200 pages, feel free, it's on the FRA website. Uh, in any case, so here's what the program looks like. Oh, and by the way, the reason we're doing all this is that people don't like to report dangerous things. If I'm driving a train, and I go around the curve a little bit too fast, and I don't see a signal, and I don't crash the train, but I almost crash the train, the last thing I'm gonna do is go to my boss and say, gee, you know, uh, I was going around this curve a little bit too fast and that signal wasn't working quite right so I didn't quite understand that it was a problem and I didn't crash the train, but I almost crashed the train and so we made her do something about people's paying attention and fixing the signals. Right? I'm not gonna go to my boss and say that, I guarantee it. But I might go to a trusted third party and tell them the story they would strip out all the details so they wouldn't know that it's Johnny Morrell at mile post 47 on such and such a line at a particular time and so on and so forth. They would strip out the details and then in fact it would be possible to, for, for the railroad or whoever is involved to actually try to analyze this problem. And that's done a lot, it's done a lot, in, it's done not enough in the railroad industry, it's done a lot in the aviation industry by the way. In any case, so the program works like this. You advertise the program to employees so they know that they can submit confidential reports. And presumably they then submit the reports. And I could have made this model and made those two different boxes, but I didn't want to do that. You train the close call team in analysis. It's one thing to know there's a problem. It's another thing to know how to solve the problem. How do you do root cause analysis? How do you look at contributing causes? How do you decide what's important? This whole 
ritual behind that. And in this program of mine, there is a specific causal analysis that I'm calling X. There are lots of these out there, by the way, but you're training them in X, because what you believe is that this is the way for people to solve these kinds of problems. So the third party receives the anonymous incidents, and the one, two, the third box from the left, team analysis using protocol X. And they can do that because the third party anonymizes the reports and sends it to people. They've been trained in protocol X, and there's all kinds of stuff missing here about recruiting labor and recruiting management, how you go about doing these things, but we're leaving all that out. But they, they do that. They make a recommendation to management. Management fixes the problem. The fact that management has fixed the problem, meaning they care about safety, we have this nice feedback loop. It goes back to advertising the program and because management now, I'm sorry, labor now thinks that management cares about safety, they're gonna submit more reports. So we have this nice, clean kind of program. And by the way, there's a feedback loop. I'm as guilty as everybody else, but I write these models all the time with feedback loops. And I have almost never in my life actually evaluated a feedback loop. <laughs> right? You could do that. You could be qualitative or quantitative about it. But if you have a program model with a feedback loop, you can measure it. Has anybody ever actually done an evaluation where they've measured a feedback loop and actually built in data for it? So you're all as bad as I am. But if you think about it, feedback loops matter, and almost nobody evaluates them. Leave that alone for the moment. So here's our program. What might happen over time? Here's what I did. You can see that I have three programs up in the upper right, and I left out the details in the green boxes because I couldn't put all the type in to get people to read all that stuff. So you can, but you can see how the architecture is basically the same in those three programs. But there are differences, and I use these big blue boxes because hopefully you can now read what it says. But in variant number one, the team analysis uses what I like to call the catch as catch can analysis method, which basically means they've given up on this formal analysis method calling, calling it X, you know, you pull this out of root cause analysis and industrial engineering or whatever you want to do. But they've given up on that because you have a bunch of guys, and I know this from railroads, and so trust me, there are no women in, around these tables. But you have a bunch of guys and they're sitting around the room and they're, they're experts, right? They manage railroads, they drive trains, they fix trains, they fix track, they know what's what. Uh, and so they look at this problem and they don't worry about you know, this fancy methodical way of solving a problem. They talk about it amongst themselves. They know what to do. And so in variant number one, the use of this project, of, of this uh, specific method of problem solving goes away. But they come up with a solution. And once they do that, they ship it off to management, and management uh, implements a solution. That's the box at the extreme right. And there's a nice little feedback loop here because uh, all the workers now see that management is trying to improve safety, and so they send in more accident reports. And as my wife likes to say, Bob's your uncle, right? Everything's great. In the third variant, it's different still. We now have the team analysis still using the catch as catch can method, but you'll notice that the box on the extreme right is gone. The box on the extreme right is management knows that there's a problem, they implement a solution. In this new version, the analysis team itself implements the solution. Because after all, these are guys who understand what's what, and they know what's to be done, and they know that something needs to be fixed, and so they pull together an ad hoc group of people to fix the problem, and they fix the problem. You don't need upper management to do this. And there is a feedback loop, though. It goes back to workers submit problems because they see that the railroad is improving safety, and they're very happy about that, and they realize that what they say will make a difference, so off they go and they report more. Now you'll notice, though, that I used a dotted line there because that is a qualitatively different kind of a feedback loop. Because in the first two versions, the feedback loop goes from upper management to the people submitting reports. In this last version, it's qualitatively different because the feedback loop goes from the analysis team and the ad hoc groups solving the problem and it goes back. So we now have three separate versions of the program that have developed over time. What I did then is to make up data. 
I highly, it's very easy to make examples when you're making up data, I highly recommend it. But the point is this, what an evolutionary biology and ecological perspective would say is, we care about what kinds of variants over time, meaning that there's sort of a speciation factor here, because they all look the same, but they're really kind of different. We have selection pressure, the idea being, why is it that these things change over time? They're responding to what's going on in their environment. And so you have all these different sort of ecological kinds of forces going on. So I made up two different possible scenarios. In the first scenario, and we have data year two, three, two, two, four, and six is the way I did it. So in the scenario on the left, you can see how at the beginning of the program, it pretty much follows the program as implemented is the most popular program, but some of these other variants are beginning to pop up. Comes year four, and it looks like what's happening is that that variant one, that middle variant, is the most popular variant. But the one on the bottom, there seems to be a fair number of those also, but the original program as designed, that ain't doing so well. Comes the next year, uh, six, year six. We see that variant three, the one where you're uh, using the ad hoc solution teams, you're not involving upper management at all, that's become the most popular program, followed by the middle one where you're still going to management but you are using your ad hoc method. And sure enough, that original method, that original great program that you might have even had some evaluation data to show that it's decreasing uh, accident rates, which we have actually if you read the 200 page report, that hasn't done very well at all. So what we have here is multiple programs evolving over time in an ecosystem, and that is giving you a sort of a speciation change, because they're really all the same programs that they sure don't look alike. And by the way, you could have an interesting discussion about that third version, is it really the same species? Is it really the same program that we began with? And some people might say yes, and some people might say no, because the essence of the program is action by upper management. It's gone away in that third version. It's not the same species. And you can have all kinds of arguments about that. And by the way, don't think that people in ecology and evolutionary biology don't argue about that. Endless amounts of ink and pixels are spilled over the question of when a species becomes a different species. So that's sort of a common problem. But what we see here is that things are going pretty well, right? The total number of programs is 47. And at least in some of their versions, they have grown. You know, I'd be pretty happy with this. Now let's look at scenario two. That is a very different kinds of scenario. Because what we see then, firstly, is that the total number of programs is pretty low. Even after six years, it only goes to 26. So, so the population is not thriving. Secondly, if you look at that middle, that year four, it looks as if you're doing okay. Yeah, it's not, the, it's not the original program, it's variant number one, but there's a fair amount of it. Right? You feel, you know, and there are a couple of variant twos going on, the one on the bottom, and you know, if I saw that in year four, even though the program as it was originally designed wasn't doing so well in terms of spreading to different locations, I feel pretty good about this. But then I'd look at year six, and I'd say, Something's going on. There was something anomalous about that middle data collection, but really this program is not th this program and its versions are not thriving very well. Now, if I had that data, I would make very different I would come to very different kinds of conclusions about the effectiveness of this close call reporting system. And the only reason I would do that is because I cared about speciation issues. Do these things change over time? How do they change over time? I care about population size because we've no looked at the number of programs that we have. I care about birth and death rates because especially if you look at scenario number two between year and four and year, year four and year six, it's obvious that however many of these programs are coming into existence, more of them are going away. So you have a decrease in, in the population rate. And as I said, I would not look at, I would make very different conclusions about the program. Now, if somebody came to me and said, I don't need all this stuff, I would do that anyway, right? I mean, this is not a crazy thing for any evaluator under any circumstances to look at. And if they said, 
I don't need to think in terms of ev evolutionary biology or ecology. I would do that anyway. I'd say, great, I'm for that. The best I can tell you is that I would not have done it before I started thinking about this, and I'm willing to bet that a reasonable, reasonable number of other evaluators wouldn't have done it either. And so that's the issue that I came, that I tried to impress upon you at the beginning of this talk, which is you might not need it. There are cases where you do need it. If you answer the right questions without ev in invoking any of these constructs, that's great. What I really believe is that unless you are sensitive to these constructs, you're less likely to come up with these questions. If that's not true, you'd all do it anyway. That's great. Uh, let's see another example here. I had a very interesting conversation with some friends of mine a couple of weeks ago, and they said, we're not interested in evaluating programs. We are interested in evaluating policies. And they showed me the policy that they wanted to evaluate, I think, had to do with healthcare, I think, I don't remember, maybe education. And they had a program theory, a logic model, it was pretty traditional, it was the kind of thing that any of us would do, would say, well, if we make this policy change, we would expect more girls to go to school, let's say. So it's a very nice model, implement policy, more girls to go to school, you know, nice arrow. You could certainly test that. And it is certainly true that when you change a policy, there are these immediate direct effects, and you would expect them to change, and you go ahead and you do your research and figure out whether that's happened or not. But the more we talked about this, the more we thought about it, we said it is also a policy change is also an ecosystem change or a change in the environment. So if I have a policy, let's say, changes tax policy so that small businesses can now start up and get going more easily, I would certainly have a direct line between change policy and small business startup. And you know, I'd make sure I had some methodology that could figure that out. But I would also think to myself, if there were more small businesses, what else would happen? What other things might happen because you've changed this policy unrelated at least directly to small business? And the more we thought about this, the more we thought there are lots and lots of these examples. So we began to think about policy change in terms of a change in the environment. And again, I made up some examples. So we have two examples, scenario one and scenario two. Right? And each one of those lines is a policy. Uh, and so the way I set this up is it says normalized number. You need that on the y-axis because you're measuring lots of different things. You might measure disease rates, number of girls going to school, number of small business startups, and to throw all that onto a single axis, you need to somehow normalize your data. So we do that. And then we look at calendar time. And in scenario number one, what you can see, oh, and the red line was sort of a very nice interrupted time series analysis, and we're pretending that when you implement the policy, it's a sharp implementation, so it's a nice clean before and after, which we know isn't true, but that's okay, I made it up anyway. So in that first example, we've got those blue dots in the middle, and something's doing very well, right? That policy change takes place, and those blue circles, they increase over time, whatever that means some healthcare indicator, some educational indicator, some measure of the number of diabetes control programs, whatever it is. It's doing pretty well. Then we have the green, I don't even want to call them thingies, up on the top, and they're pretty stable. And by the way, I was thinking of just making a straight line, but I thought, you know, the world is messier than that. Even when things are stable, they jump around a lot, so I couldn't bring myself to just make a straight line. Uh, so that green, policy, the, those green indicators on the top, they're pretty stable. If you look at the black that takes the nosedive, that's not doing real well at all. When that policy change takes place, whatever that is, it's not thriving very well. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at, on the bottom at that stuff going up, I guess I should have brought my laser pointer, but, but you can see it. Uh, whatever that is, shortly after the policy gets put in place, but not immediately, this entity comes into existence and it's doing pretty well. You know, it sort of increases steadily over time. It's not so bad, I guess. Now you look at scenario number two. Scenario number two is quite different. First of all, if you look at the extreme right, you'll see that two kinds of programs have come into existence, not just one. This black one here, it still's not doing so well, but it hangs on for a much longer period of time. 
these guys here sort of converge, which is not true here. This doesn't do very well over time, even though it doesn't go extinct. You know, here it sort of stays constant. So the point is that if we believe that the new policy has changed the environment, we can look at multiple different kinds of programs, multiple different kinds of social and economic indicators, and we can track them over time. And again, if I were doing this and I looked at that data, and I looked at scenario number one, I would come to very different conclusions about what this policy does in the world than I would if I had scenario number two. But the only, I should, now, it's not the only reason. If someone came to me and said, I would have done this anyway, I would have said, great. The best I can say is that I would not have done it anyway. And the only reason I would think to do it is that I've begun to think in terms of ecology and what do I care about. I think about the timing of changes. The fact that there's a change after that policy gets put into place doesn't mean all those changes are going to happen at the same time. Because it, it, if you change an environment, it might take a while for some new organism to begin to thrive. And all the ones that aren't thriving might go extinct right away. They might hang on for a good long time. So I would have thought about that. The diversity of programs, in that second scenario, the diversity goes up because you have two new programs that are coming into, into existence and only one that goes extinct. And so diversity in the community matters and we could talk a lot about relationships among different programs and why diversity matters. Oh, I got plenty of time, I can talk forever, great. So we care about the diversity. And I don't want to get into that right now, but ask me later, I'll tell you why. We can have description of the organisms, right? Each of these are different kinds of programs or social indicators or whatever they are. And if this were an ecological analysis, you'd say, what's living in the community, right? And what are they, right? You can ask the same kind of question here. I wouldn't have thought to do that. I might, I'd like to think at least that I would have counted them. But whether I actually would have gone to the details of what are they, I don't think I would have done that. Number rate of old program declines. You care about what's going extinct. Network formation and network effects. I don't show this here, but we presume that all these different programs and all these different kinds of activities are networked one with the other. And the nature of that network will change depending on which ones are going extinct and which ones are thriving and so on and so forth. Commonalities in programs that thrive or decline. The programs that seem to not do so well, is there anything in common about them? Because they might look different. You know, one might involve girls' education, one might involve public health. But if they're both not doing very well, I might say to myself, are there any commonalities? The species that aren't doing well, yeah, they're different species, but do they eat the same kind of food? Do they, you know, whatever it is that they do. And I would think ecologically and say, why is it that some are thriving and some are not? And again, if people would have done that anyway, more power to you. I don't think that I would have. Uh, and then the number and rate of appearance of new programs. So the point is these are all the kinds of examples that you can come up with if you think about the policy changes changing the environment. And then you look at these programs as organisms, species within the environment. And so you can look at diversity and birth rates and death rates and commonalities. And you can then ask yourself the question, what is it about the way things are changing such that some seem to be thriving and some not? Uh, and my message to you here is that ecological, evolutionary, biological thinking turns the mind in that direction, or at least it turns my mind in that direction. Uh, by the way, the reason the color scheme is different here is because I actually stole this from my workshop on complexity. In those days, I was into navy blue. So if it looks different, it's because it actually comes. But what I want to do now is illustrate how program theory, which leads to a whole lot of different analysis and a whole lot of different conclusions, can change when you move a traditional program logic. By the way, I use things like logic models and program theories pretty much interchangeably. And I know that that gives some people apoplexy. And if you're really into the differences, I'll maybe try to clean up my language. But I, I basically tend to think of them as the same thing. A lot of people like to throw tomatoes at me when I say that, but it's good enough for me. Anyway, so this is a nice traditional kind of an evaluation of an AIDS program that I would do. I'd love to have data like this, right? So what do we have? We have an AIDS prevention and treatment program. 
and it has funding and it defines its services and it gets implemented. Then we care about the amount of service and presumably the amount of service can go up or down. By the way, most people when they make pictures like this don't put directionality indicators on, but I think they should. Anyway, we have issues of service quality because presumably all of this kind of activity is going to increase the quality of the services that are out there. And so if you have good quality services and you have enough of it, the incidence and prevalence of AIDS goes down. And if the incidence and prevalence goes down, you see, that's a mistake. That's not negative. That's, yeah, that is negative. That's correct. Because if the incidence and prevalence goes down, then you have increased quality of life, quality of work life, family, community, right? So yeah, it's a negative, ne negative, negative. This goes down, these things go up. And you'll notice here we have numerical kinds of what goes up, what goes down. We have a feedback loop from incidence and prevalence to the program and from these outcomes to the program, and that's a Q qualitative, because we don't really know what they're going to do, right? All we know is that if they have any brains about them, if they see changes in what's happening in terms of their outcomes, they might think to change what they do and adjust and so on and so forth. Pretty good model. I don't know about you guys, but I'd love to be able to evaluate something like that. Now what I'm going to do is to take this exact same model and drop it into some ecological thinking. And life's going to look, and look a little different. And by the way, I am not advocating one or another of these approaches. I've given you one. I'm about to give you a second one. Don't want to imply that one's better than the other. Because first of all, I'm a great believer in using multiple models. If you think about maps, right? Maps have different projections. And uh, Mercator projections aren't very good for understanding land masses, because the further north and south you go, the more out of proportion, the bigger they get. But if you're plotting a course, it means that all of your courses cross latitude and longitude lines at the same angle. If you're sailing across the ocean, that matters. But if you're teaching kids about geography, you want one of these projections that has other kinds of distortions, but it keeps the land masses the same. And one map isn't better than the other, just useful for different things. And I actually, I'm going off on a tangent now, mm -hmm. but I really think that when people develop program models, they should develop multiple program models. So now what do we have here? This is my traditional program. What I have done now is drop this into a context of some ecological thing. What do we have here? If we have this program, what it is doing is pulling resources from the greater public health system into AIDS treatment and prevention. And when I say resources, I don't mean only money. You can see the list here. Career choices, you're a nurse, you're looking for a program to work in. Well, it's the AIDS stuff that seems to be where all the action is and where all the interesting stuff is going on. Where are you going to look for a job? Policy synergies, the people who make policies, they're going to be thinking about AIDS programs. Political capital is the same thing. If there's a lot of money and action in AIDS programs, where are you going to invest your political capital when you do your planning in the future? Intellectual effort, right? If all the nurses and doctors and policy planners are thinking about AIDS, that's where the best thinking is going to be. Uh, the skills you develop, you spend a lot of time working in AIDS prevention, uh, that's what you become good at. Someone then implements a program on some other kind of health care, and they're looking around, and the talent might not be there, and so on and so forth, informal relationships. So when I say resources, I don't mean just money, but these are all the kinds of resources that make a difference. And you'll notice there are no X's here, but AIDS gets all the X's, right? Now, what do we know from a system point of view? We know that if you're any good at your program, What's going to happen is you're going to get what you try to get. Now, if you look at this original model, there are all kinds of different outcomes here, but they are all highly correlated, every single one of them. So you can read these things, right? There are going to be correlations between incidence and prevalence and the related outcomes, and they're all in the same direction. If one gets better, the other gets better. One might go up and one might go down, but they're going to get better. My okay, Todd? So what happens here now? The rest of the system, we have tertiary care and routine care and prenatal care and care for women. I, these are the kinds of things in a healthcare system. And that this healthcare system might not be very good, but it's about as good as it's gonna get. It's sort of evolved to a point of equilibrium. 
about as good as it's going to get under the resources. And it might be very good, it might be awful. If it's here in Denver, it's going to be great. And if it's in Malawi, it's not going to be so great. But it's going to be about as good as it can get. Here, what we have is AIDS gets better. Right? But everything else adapts to the resource-poor environment and gets worse. And that is because... Now, I've had people say, oh, that's ridiculous, John. You know, one gets better, there are going to be synergies, they're going to be positive, everything else is going to get better. I have reasons to believe that's not true in most cases, but I don't want to get into that. And some people say, well, that's just your personality. And there is something to that, by the way. Uh, but it is also true that I actually have some sort of intellectually. Uh, and so what you have here is that the equilibrium changes. Right? Now, that's how systems work. That's how ecologies work. If all the resources go into one of those organisms, then everything else has to adapt. It's conceivable they will adapt and end up being better, but I don't think that that's true. Right? So here we have an example where thinking about these things in terms of equilibria and uh, evolution, you begin to understand that you could do this evaluation here just fine. But you could also collect data and say, is this really true that these res I mean, I, this is a hypothesis that all these resources get pulled over. It might not be true. Right? So you could test that. And you could look at what these programs are, and you could see how they adapt. You could get real data on that subject. Now, you might not. You might say, look, all I really care about is this, because it's the AIDS I care about, and I'm going to find out if that works. And that's not a bad thing. But you could look at it this way as well. And this has implications, as I said for methodology, data collection, program theory, uh, intellectual capital on the evaluation team, and on and on. And you can see how if you had to put together an evaluation team and a methodology to do this, it would look quite different than putting together an evaluation team and a methodology to do that. And if someone said, well, I don't really need that, I would have known it anyway, and I would have done it, I'd come back and feel like a broken record. I'd say, that's great. You don't need all this stuff. The best I can say is that I did not stop think, start thinking about this until I got serious about thinking about systems change in a biological and um, ecological point of view. Yes, I have much more to say. You guys should feel free to ask me questions. They have access to this, right? You gave me. Yes, we're going to share. So it. you could look at all of that. Uh, if you have questions about it, as they say, you know where to find me. Send me email. Give me a call. If I'm not around, I'll call back. I'm, I'll talk about this stuff ad infinitum. Uh, and the reason is that I'm trying to learn myself. The only way I can figure out whether and how and when this kind of stuff is useful in evaluation is for people to talk to me about their evaluations. And sometimes they do and I say, oh, what I'm talking about is very interesting, but sort of just go ahead and do what you're doing. Sometimes I have these insights, like this idea of policy as an environmental change. I never thought about that. I was talking to some friends of mine at the Global, Evalu Global Environmental Fund, and they were talking about changing policies and about what would happen. I said, ah, you know, you could think of it that way. So I'm always happy to talk to people. But as I said, I'm around. I'm really serious about talking to people. If you have questions, I'll make up answers. <laughs> and um, I hope it's useful. And remember, a special award for anybody who can figure out why I made my company the way I named it. Thank you for all being patient enough to listen to